Let's now talk about the polar form of a complex number and what that has to do with the complex exponential function. To explain how that works, let's return to the complex plane where we can visualize complex numbers in terms of vectors. We have the real axis, the imaginary axis, and we have a number represented as a vector here. So z is x plus i y. It's identified with the point x y in the complex plane. x its real part is here and y its imaginary part is here. Um, so let's see what happens when we pass to polar coordinates. You could say x plus i y is the Cartesian form of a complex number. So let's introduce r, the radius and theta here, the angle. Uh, then in the world of complex numbers, r is called the modulus of z. And we know that the formula for that has to be square root of x squared plus y squared. So it's going to be the length of the vector here that represents z. So that is the, the modulus. And theta is called the argument of the complex number z. And some trigonometry will give us what this angle here is. So for instance, here you can take the length y and divide by the length x and you'll get the tangent of that angle. So we could say that in the case of this figure here, we have that theta is the arc tangent of y over x. This is not going to work every time, but definitely if theta is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, this is going to work. So in that range, we have arc tangent y over x. If not, we have to think a little more with trigonometric formulas. Okay, so let's see how that works on an example. Let's say that z is equal to 3i. Let's find it in the complex plane and check out what its polar form would be. So maybe it's here somewhere on the imaginary axis. This would be where 3i is. Well, the modulus that corresponds to that here will be equal to 3. That will be the length, if you want, of the vector from the origin to the point 3i. And the angle for 3i is going to be pi over 2 because this is where it sits. It's on the imaginary axis. We have theta is equal to pi over 2 in this case. And as always, when you have angles, those are defined up to 2 pi. So it's equally valid to write any integer multiple of 2 pi added to pi over 2. So here n is uh, an integer. Okay, so this is how you would go from the Cartesian form to the polar form, but really more important for us in getting to the point of complex exponentials, what is really important is to do it the other way around and to start from x and y and express those in terms of theta and r. So x is equal to r cosine theta and y equals to r sine theta. This is these are the basic formulas. So if you plug that in the expression of z, you get that z would be r times cosine theta plus i sine theta. Now, we're getting to a combination here of sine and cosine that is really remarkable. It is very important. It is in itself uh, very, very special and much more special than the trigonometric functions in isolation. And so I'd like to convince you that this combination has to do with the complex exponential function. Since it's such an important combination of theta, let's give it a name. Let's say this is y of theta, and let's check out the properties of this function y. So let's change variable and, and turn theta into t just for the time being and write that y of t is cosine t plus i sine t. Let's go ahead and differentiate this function and see what happens. So we have y dot of t is now going to be minus sine t plus i cosine t which we can rewrite as i cosine t. Let's take the second term here. And then for the first term, the minus sign, I'm going to turn that into a i squared. What we see is that y dot of t is exactly i times y of t. It's this term here that's i times that term. And this term is i times this term. So we have y dot equals i y of t. And we also know that if we uh, try to value t equals 0 in this formula here, then we'll have cosine 0 is equal to 1, sine, sine 0 is equal to 0, and therefore y of 0 is equal to 1. This is rather suggestive for those of you who know differential equations. This should start to look very familiar. In fact, we already know what happens in the real case. So let me remind you that if we have x dot of t, and let's just change name for the function, call it x, x dot of t is equal to 
a x of t with that initial condition x of 0 is equal to 1 if we work back in that case where a was a real number then we know exactly what happens the solution in fact the unique solution to this differential equation with that initial condition is the real exponential e to the a t so if there's any justice what we're looking at here, where the number a is replaced by the imaginary unit i, is strongly suggested that we should be in presence of the exponential of an imaginary number. So this would suggest that the y of t solution of this equation here should be e to the i t. We don't know yet what is the exponential of an imaginary number, but if it is, if it is anything, it should be the solution of that equation, just by analogy. And this is something that was first noticed by Euler quite some time ago, like many things in mathematics was discovered by Euler, and gave rise to the definition of the imaginary exponential. Let's go back to the variable theta. e to the i theta is in fact that function y we just saw, which I remind you we started uh, from this combination of cosine and sine. So e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta and solves this differential equation that we just saw. So this is called Euler's formula as a result. Okay, good. So this is this is quite plausible that this should be a good definition for the exponential. But of course, we we want we want to make sure this is a legitimate exponential. And there are things we know about exponentials that have to be true if this is going to be a good concept. And uh, really, the most important one of those is the property that if you exponentiate a sum, it's going to give you the product of an exponential. So the question here is: This really an exponential? Are we really in presence of a formula that would allow us to do such a thing. This is something that we need to check by hand just to be sure. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's try to see what the left hand side uh, becomes. So let's uh, check what the definition gives us with the cosines and sines. We're going to have cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2 plus i sine theta 1 plus theta 2. So let's go ahead and if you remember your trig formulas, this is when you apply them. Uh, you can always look them up. Cosine of a sum here. I am particularly bad at remembering them. So this is something that I have to look up. And um, we end up having here uh, the product of cosine minus the product of sine for this first bit here. And then we have plus i times now uh, the product sine theta 1 cosine theta 2 plus sine theta 2 cosine theta 1. This is what it turns out it is after you expand with a trig formula. It is a mess. And this is as far as we're going to get with the left-hand side. But so now the question is, if we look at the right-hand side, do we get the same mess? And so let's check it out. We have cosine theta 1 plus i sine theta 1 times cosine theta 2 plus i sine theta 2. And so let's distribute that. Let's expand. We have cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2. Now, for the imaginary uh, terms, we have i sine theta 1, cosine theta 2. We have i sine theta 2, cosine theta 1. And then we have the term where we have i squared, i squared sine theta 1 sine theta 2. Now uh, let's check out if the terms match. We have this one here that matches that one, so that's good. Uh, the, the minus sine theta 1 sine theta 2 is exactly i squared th sine theta 1 sine theta 2, so that's good. And now for the imaginary ones, this one is the same as this one, and this one is the same as this one. So yes, it works. We do have the property of exponentials um, that adding arguments correspond to multiplying. The exponential is good news, so we can now legitimately use that as the definition of exponential of an imaginary number. As a conclusion, what we have achieved so far is that we have been able to express the polar form of a complex number in the following form, r, r times e to the i theta. This is what the polar form is. And the point of bringing this up, of expressing the polar form in this way is that it allows us to do multiplications, divisions, and such operations much, much faster and much more conveniently than with the Cartesian form. 
Indeed, if you have z1 is r1 e to the i theta 1 and z2 is equal to r2 e to the i theta 2, look how easy it is to do z1, z2 without having to distribute anything to r1, r2 and then e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2. The angles just get added up. In particular, if you have z squared, you just square the modulus to give you r squared and then you double the angle here. This is what happens when you take the square of a complex number already there just by looking at this formula, you know what's going to happen in the complex planes as the angle will be doubled. Now the scary division of complex numbers, which in Cartesian form involves the crazy trick of applying top and bottom by the complex conjugate. This is very easy now. We have r1 e to the i theta 1 divided by r2 e to the i theta 2 and you use properties of the exponential and you get that the real moduli just get divided by one another and for the exponential we have theta 1 minus theta 2. And what I've used in being able to write this is the fact that if you look at the inverse of a number z, r e to the i theta, and you take the inverse of that, you'll have 1 over r and e to the minus i theta. This is what happens when you take um, the uh, power negative 1 of an exponential, you have minus in the exponent. This wor works here as well. Okay, so for the formulas here, I just uh, want to give you one more. If you have the complex conjugate here, which I remind you is x minus i y in Cartesian form, doing complex conjugation with the polar form is not messy either. It's actually quite nice. And let's see what it turns out to be. We have the conjugate of a product. R is real, so it, it gets out of the conjugate and you have the conjugate of e to the i theta. Now, this is just a cosine theta plus i sine theta conjugate and we know what happens when we conjugate a complex number like this the imaginary part ends up picking a negative sign so it's r cosine theta minus i sine theta which is nothing but r e to the minus i theta this is what the expression of the complex conjugate is it's quite nice it's actually not that different from the one of the inverse the Modulus is not the same, but the angle is a negative angle like it is for the inverse of z. Okay, so that's it for the very nice properties of multiplication and division now with the polar form of these numbers. Let us return now to the complex plane and see the implication of these considerations with the complex exponential for the identification of the unit circle in the complex plane with the trigonometric circle. So let's go back and see a few examples of polar forms now, uh, real and imaginary. Let's do the unit circle. And uh, so that would be the circle Z modulus is equal to 1. And let's pick a few numbers. We know what they are. Here we have 1. Here we have i. We have negative 1. We have negative i. So for Z equals 1, in the, the polar form of z equals 1 is uh, radius equal to 1 and angle is equal to 0. This is the origin of how you measure angles is with respect to the x-axis. So theta is equal to 0, which gives rise to 1 is equal to e to the i 0. This is what should happen with exponentials. Exponential of 0 is equal to 1. So this is good. Uh, now let's move on to z equals i. Then uh, the radius, the modulus is still equal to 1. The distance here to the origin, the angle is now pi over 2. So if we put this together, we'll see that the expression of i in polar coordinates is 1 times exponential i pi over 2. So we can call this e to the i pi over 2. This is where it is. And now if you uh, go ahead and you try z equals negative 1, you have that r equals 1, theta is equal to pi, so we have the identification of negative 1 with e to the i pi, which is this crazy formula that just comes out of sines and cosines. You get e to the i pi is negative 1, and finally, when z equal to negative i, you get r equals 1, theta is equal to 3 pi over 2, then you have negative i is e to the i 3 pi over 2, and again, weird looking if you don't know complex exponentials, but it makes complete sense after you've seen the definitions. Okay, and let's finish with a, another exercise here. Now let's try to find all the numbers z such that the fourth power of z is equal to i, the imaginary unit. Let's do that exercise. It's uh, 
not something that I recommend attempting to do with the Cartesian form. But now that we have the polar form, we can go ahead and try to solve exercises like this. This is really a root finding for polynomials with complex coefficients. Uh, and so the way to do that is to say, let's seek z of the form r e to the i theta, plug that in there, and then solve for theta. r to the fourth e to the i four theta for the fourth power of z in the left-hand side. And then in the right-hand side, i we've just seen is equal to e to the i pi over 2. So now we have two num complex numbers in their polar form and left-hand side, right-hand side. So we can go ahead and identify the modulus and the argument. We have r to the fourth is equal to 1, uh, first of all. And since r is a positive number, the only solution to that is r equals 1. And secondly, if we identify the arguments, we're now going to have 4 theta is equal to pi over 2. And again, we're talking about angles here, which are always defined up to an integer multiple of 2 pi. So let's not forget to add 2 and pi. It, this would, will really matter now. Um, and so uh, now when we divide left and right by 4, we have the expression of theta as being pi over 8 plus n pi over 2. And the values of n, integer values of n, that are going to be relevant here in this expression are going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, and that's it. Because if little n is equal to 4, then we have an integer multiple of 2 pi here, which will reduce it to the case n equals 0. So only these four values uh, are the relevant ones. All the other ones reduce to either to one of these four uh, values by 2 pi periodicity. Uh, and so this is now the answer. These are in polar form all the complex numbers such that their fourth power will be equal to i. And we can go ahead and plot them in the complex plane now. We have uh, here again, uh, this is going to be the unit circle again. Uh, this is where i is. And this is where we expect the first uh, fourth root of i will be. We'll take n equals 0 here. So we'll have an angle of pi over 8 and a radius of 1. So it's somewhere around here. And the other ones are going to be the, the numbers where you add an argument of pi over 2 to that. So there's going to be one here, one here, and one here. So there are, there are four solutions here to this equation. And here we have plotted them here in the complex plane, real imaginary. So again, polar form, really convenient for everything that has to do with multiplication and division, and is also a good way of handling, you know, exercises like this.